All right. Uh, it's fun to be here. This, uh, I thought this was the first Philip K. Dick conference, but uh, Gil was telling me it's the second one. So it's, it's nice that it's right here in San Francisco. This is nice and fitting. So uh, I'm going to talk to you for half an hour. And uh, so I'm going to mix together. I'm going to mash up a couple of things. Uh, I once published an essay called Haunted by Phil Dick. And also I have uh, some, an afterword to my collection of my four Ware's novels, the Ware Tetralogy, which if you haven't read it, you can get it online at rudyrucker.com slash Ware's. There's even a Creative Commons version for those of you who are impecunious. Uh, so this starts in uh, the spring of 1982, and I was... Uh, at that point, I, I was about to lose my job. I had been a teacher in Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, I was teaching at a woman's college called Randolph-Macon. And I was playing in a punk band, sort of an amateur punk band. We were called the Dead Pigs. <laughs> you had to be dead something to be a punk band, so we were the pigs. Uh, and Philip Dick died around then. He lived uh, 28 to 82. And uh, I was thinking about him a lot, because I was, at this point, I'd, I'd published, I think, five science fiction novels. And uh, I was having trouble getting any traction. I wasn't breaking out. When you start your writing career, you imagine sometimes it's going to be fairly smooth sailing. And it's more of what you would call a long road to hoe. A anyway, but I would sometimes try to think about what Phil Dick would have been writing, and uh, there's this trick I like to do about getting to know someone and creating a, a mental emulation of them, so I sort of have them living in my head. And uh, I heard there was going to be a, a Phil Dick Award, and I was hoping I would get it. Now that winter, in January 83, uh, we went to a party. I'll just read this part here. We went to a party at a woman's house in the country. We didn't know too many of the people. They were rednecks. And in those days in the South, a redneck was a person with long hair and a scraggly beard. And it was mellow. There was a lot of weed, loud music, everyone getting off. At some point, I glanced across the room and in walked Phil Dick. He didn't say he was Phil Dick. But he looked to be wearing his 1974 body. His hair was still dark. He had a beard. I don't know what Phil Dick really looks like, but I knew that this was the guy. At first, I just grinned over at him slyly, like Aphid Jerry eyeing the carrier people in the scanner darkly. Then finally, I introduced myself and drank beer and whiskey in the kitchen with him for a while. Of course, I was too hip to confront him with my knowledge of his true identity. The man's cover was that he was in the garbage business, the garbage king of Campbell County, Virginia, he said. He had a fleet of trucks, and he'd furnished his entire house with cast-off items gleaned from the trash flow. I steered the conversation around to science fiction, mentioning my novel Software. What's it about? It's about robots on the moon. In a way, they're black people. The guy who invented them, he's my father, is dying, and the robots build him a fake robot body to get his software out of his brain. Go on. They run the software on a computer, but the computer is big and has to be kept at four degrees Kelvin. It follows him around in a Mr. Frosty truck. <laughs> There's a big brain-eating scene, too. Sounds all right. So uh, the plug worked. In March of 1983, I got the Philip K. Dick Award for software. So we went up to New York for the awards ceremony, and Blade Runner had just come out. And so I went to see it before the awards ceremony with some other science fiction people. One of them was Phil's friend, Ray Faraday Nelson. And at the time, I'd wondered if Phil would have been happy about the movie, but Ray assured me that he would have liked it. Then we got, they'd rented an artist's loft in the village. It was all painted with silver on all the walls. And then uh, one of my college friends was there, a guy called Barry Feldman. He was a painter, a very, very good painter, but completely unsuccessful. He just didn't at all have the right kind of personality to get into galleries. 
And he had a suit on, which, and he looked like Chico Marx. He was a short guy. <laughs> and I had this sudden idea, since Gary looked sort of, I mean, Barry looked sort of jealous, I said, why don't you stand by the door and just tell everybody that comes in that you're Rudy Rucker? Because nobody knows what I look like. Because I was not at all a member of the science fiction scene. So Barry did that for an hour, and I stood across the room drinking and hanging out with my friends. But eventually I met some people too. And then it slowly came out who I was, and I stood on the bar and I gave my acceptance speech, and I'll read you that. I'd like to just say a few words about immortality. I have a theory about how artistic immortality works. When you're reading a well-written book and totally into it, then you are, for those few moments, actually identical with the person who wrote the book. It's my feeling that artistic immortality means that the artist is, however briefly, reborn over and over again. We could express this idea in terms of computers. If you can somehow write down most of your program, then some other person can put this program onto his or her brain and become a simulation of you. Now, if I say that Phil Dick is not really dead, what I mean is, he was such a powerful writer that his works exercise a sort of hypnotic force. Many of us have been Phil Dick for brief flashes, and these flashes will continue as long as there are readers. Let's push the idea a little harder. That's what SF is all about, pushing ideas out into new territory. Even if there are no more readers, the Phil Dick persona would still exist. Each of our personalities is immortal as a permanent possibility of information processing. Another push now, just as each of Phil's works is a coding of his personality, we might go on to say that sometimes various authors are, as people, examples of the same higher level platonic archetype. And I'd like to think that on some level, Phil and I are different instances of the same form. So the essence of good SF is the transmutation of abstract ideas into funky fact. If it's all possible for a spirit to return from the dead, Maybe Phil will do it. I think actually coming in here, he spare changed me in the parking lot. <laughs> and then he offered me a movie deal. <laughs> Over the next couple of years in Lynchburg, I saw the garbage king of Campbell a few more times. And uh, then I got into writing. I stayed in Lynchburg till the spring of 1985. And right before we left, I wrote my sequel to software, and that was called Wetware. And that was, uh, I wrote that novel in only six weeks. I just got the first computer I ever used, and I wrote it at, at white heat. It was a cool experience. And uh, this is one, pl I started incorporating beat writing into my science fiction more than some of the characters. I had, uh, I had Jack Kerouac's lesser known book, Visions of Cody. It's in some ways, parts of it sort of went into On the Road. And whenever I'd need for a, this, some of the boppers to talk, these robots, I would kind of flip it open and then kind of read a passage of you know, the tapes of Neil Cassidy and then sort of twist that around and use that for the way the robots talked. And so Wetware was a, a really a gift from the muse. In my opinion, I thought that was one of my best books. Anyway, at this point, we moved to San Jose, California. Uh, I finally got a job. At that time, I wasn't working. I was, quote, living off my writing. I was making $10,000 a year. <laughs> and uh, moved to San Jose, California, and I got a job as a computer science professor. Uh, and in a way, I was bummed out not to be a freelance writer, to be uh, back in, the, in harness. And then, but then I saw Phil Dick again when I got to San Jose. And the way this worked was, I had this friend called Dennis Polk, and he was the model for the Stay High character in my novel, Software, Wetware, Freeware, Wetware, Freeware, Realware, and uh, Fourwares. And uh, he was just a complete freak. He, was, he had like absolutely no internal sensor. He'd say, whatever passed through his head, he'd say it to you. And as soon as I met him, I kind of thought, aha, this guy can be my Neil Cassidy, okay? I'm going to have this low-life, nostalgie de la boue, God in the gutter type friend, and I can, uh, I can just use him as my character. And that was cool with Dennis, you know, because uh, 
he wanted to be famous too. Uh, and uh, so he had this job, he was working as a cab driver in San Jose. And uh, I hadn't seen Dennis in a few years, and I'll read this part too. And I was a little nervous about it. Finally he called up and asked me to stop by his apartment in downtown San Jose. Well, where he lived wasn't actually a real apartment. It was simply a small room at the head of a flight of stairs in someone's house. Wherever Dennis lives, there are always four or five half-assembled cars in the driveway and backyard. He was fixing one or several of these cars in return for being allowed to live there. His room was not much larger than a bed. There were shelves on the wall piled with electronic musical equipment, cartons of old heavy metal magazines, car parts, ragged clothes, and hundreds of Goodwill t-shirts. You got no idea how glad I am to see you, Rudy. I gave him a Xerox of the type script of wetware, and then Dennis took me downstairs to meet his speed connection. A muscular, shirtless, 50-year-old Filipino called Buffalo Bill. <laughs> I watched them crush up some crystals, snort it, and begin to jabber about skin diving for jade boulders as big as cars. I sat around and enjoyed the scene. When it was time to go, I opened the wrong door, a door which led down into the basement. Standing there on the basement stairs was a punk in painter's clothes, and just below him, staring up at me like out of a cover of the Philip K. Dick Society newsletter, was the real Phil Dick, not too tall, balding with a beard with a white stripe in it, and with the unmistakable aura of a hologram from hell. He and the punk painter were snorting lines of meth off a pocket mirror. I freaked and closed the door right back up. Who was that, I asked Dennis as soon as we got outside. On the stairs, who are the two guys on the basement stairs? Oh hell, that's just Tommy the painter. His father owns the place. The other guy with him rents the back room by the garage. He doesn't talk much, just Dennis made loud pig-like snorting noises. The same noise he'd made earlier when I'd asked him what he would do if he really did make a lot of money off Jade. <laughs> The other guy, Dennis, that's Phil Dick. You know, the Philip K. Dick Award I got in software? That was him in the basement. He must not really be dead. He's living right here in your building. Why didn't you talk to him? What would I say? <laughs> but look, Dennis, do one thing for me. After you read Wetware, give it to him. It's dedicated to him, Wave. For Philip K. Dick, 1928 to 1982, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. That's from Camus, see? Sisyphus being the proletarian of the gods, you understand, daily proving that scorn can overcome any fate, rolling another wad of paper up to the top of the same old mountain and letting it blow away. Just imagine him happy. Does he seem happy? I'll ask him. But Dennis never did talk to Phil. Phil got on his motorcycle and left that house for good, right after I did. I saw him in my rear view mirror, right before I turned onto Route 17. He was all in black, idling on the putt, wearing shades, a greasy old biker, calm with meth. He looked to me like he was headed for South San Jose. He never waved. A couple of years later, in 89, where would mean, win me a second Philip K. Dick Award. This award ceremony was at a smallish regional SF con in Tacoma, Washington. It wasn't like the artist's loft in New York at all. It was a windowless hotel ballroom with a dinner of rubber ham and mashed potatoes. I remember sitting there with Charles Platt. I wasn't making much money from my writing. And I'd started working actually two day jobs. I was teaching computer science. I was working as a programmer uh, in Sausalito. I didn't have as much time to write before, which was putting me into a depressed state of mind. Winning the award, I felt like some ruined Fitzgerald character lolling on a luxury liner in the rain. His inheritance has finally come through. His inheritance has finally come through, but it's too late. He's no longer a free man. In my exception speech, I talked about why I dedicated wetware to Phil Dick, and I added the precise quote from Albert Camus about Sisyphus. And, uh, I'll read that too. I see Sisyphus as the god of writers, or for that matter, artists in general. You labor for months and years, 
rolling your thoughts and emotions into a great ball, inching it up to the mountaintop. You let it go, and whee, it's gone. Nobody notices. And then Sisyphus walks down the mountain to start again. Here's how Camus puts it in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. I love this line. Sisyphus, proletarian of the gods, powerless and rebellious, knows the whole extent of his wretched condition. It is what he thinks of during his descent. The lucidity that is to constitute his torture at the same time crowns his victory. There is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn. <laughs> One must imagine Sisyphus happy. And as so often happens to me, nobody knew what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> Sure, we got a couple of minutes. Questions? What was that last part again? I didn't really get it. <laughs> <laughs> there were some brass bands marching around the rainy streets of Tacoma. They were having a band convention. That's about all I can tell you. <laughs> Come on, give me a. Like? Is it a plaque or a statue? Or? It's a piece of paper. And they give you $100. And actually, I split it. There was another guy who got it. Uh, I can't think of his name. Maybe Charles remembers. Uh, that's a perfect piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your coming. Uh, that's coming. It's actually available right now. I'm glad you asked that, because I have a copy to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> this, if you go to transrealbooks.com, you can get this for $6 in ebook, $16 in paperback. It's a beatnik science fiction novel, and it's about Alan Turing, the founder of computer, computers, really, and William Burroughs, the beat author. And the flap copy says, what if Alan Turing, founder of the modern computer age, escaped assassination by the Secret Service to become the lover of the beat author, William Burroughs. <laughs> what if they mutated into giant shape-shifting slugs, fled the FBI, raised Burroughs' dead wife, and tweaked the H-bombs of Los Alamos? A wild beatnik adventure. And for some reason, I had trouble publishing this book. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's got a homosexual romance. It's got unrepentant heroin use. It's got cop killing. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> Publishers are becoming such pussies. <laughs> but anyway, it came out from Transreal Books, which is a house I have something to do with. So uh, yeah, that's, I've been blogging about a lot lately. You go to RudyRucker.com. You can find out more than you want to know. So, uh, Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious since you've been a, a computer science professor for a lot of part of your life. Do you find it hard to shift gears between doing that and writing? I mean, do you have to have a good stiff break in between or something, some way of transitioning? Well, well, I'm sort of, I'm fortunate. I, I'm, I don't know, I'm just somebody, for, for whatever reason, kind of the both sides of my brain are both fairly active. So <laughs> I, I got my PhD in mathematics, but I always wanted to be a writer as well. And uh, they've really, the two areas have actually helped each other because I'll get ideas from mathematics, or then later I switched into computer science. I'll get ideas from there that are good for things to write about. But, uh, I mean, if I had to say, where is my heart, it's clearly with the writing. It's, uh, I mean, writing computer programs, it's such a brittle medium. You know, you leave out one semicolon, and you can still read your book. <laughs> your program's <laughs> not going to run. You know? So. Uh, can, you, can you leave off of the computer program 
writing? Well, it's like with sex. When you haven't managed to have sex for a week, then when you do it, it's really good, you know? <laughs> so if I was forced to do things relating to being a computer science professor, then I'd get some time to write, and I would be, you know, very happy and energetic. But uh, I could switch back pretty quickly, yeah. To me, they're, I don't know, it's sort of, a, they're, they're very related. All the things I think about, it all fits together into this. But it's hard to describe what that thing is like. Yeah? So I love this idea you have that when we read an author, we sort of become identical and kind of download this computer program. Um, you know, Dick had the idea in Vallis that we are all sort of entities made out of information. And uh, I just wonder, um, I mean, it's been a while. How do you think that idea has held up? And I mean, do we still think about it that way? Do we still think the mind is a computer? Well, a couple of things. I actually have a word for that. I call it twinking. I say you're, I'm twinking somebody. It's a made-up science fiction kind of word. I'm making a mental model of them in my head. So, you know, I'm going to twink Robert Sheckley. Or I'm going to twink Philip K. Dick. Now, is everything your computation? That's an interesting thing to discuss. I wrote a sort of, when I retired from teaching computer science, that was, I think, uh, I guess it was eight years ago. Yeah, eight years ago. Then I wrote a, th a thick tome called The Life Box, The Seashell, and The Soul. And it was sort of inspired by Stephen Wolfram's work. And uh, what I was trying to do in this book was say, what if we think everything is a computation? Now, it's not like I want to get evangelical about it and claim that that's really true. It's sort of like, ein Philosophie als ob, you know, a, a philosophy you say, what, or it's like science fiction. You say, what if we were to assume this is the case, that everything's a computation? How can we fit, what can that give us in understanding? And if you think that way, there's a lot of things you do understand better. I mean, the papers are continually surprised that, that things, like the salmon are up this year, they're down next year. The, the, the crime is up, the crime is down. And if you just think of them as computations, it's just a chaotic computation, and it takes almost nothing to make a computation be chaotic. It's very, very simple. And lots of things like that, it's useful to think of them that way. Now whether I think we're really computers, well, when I was almost done with the book, I was down in Big Sur and I was standing in the Big Sur River, you know, looking at the mountains, and I was just feeling the water. And, you know, this is not a computation. <laughs> this is water. You know, it's like Helen Keller, water. <laughs> It's not it's just this dry, abstract stuff. But yeah, I think a lot of Field's ideas are fascinating, and uh, I'm a huge fan of his. But for me, I guess we all have our favorites. For me, the favorite's always been A Scanner Darkly, which to me, that, I thought that was a really, really funny book. I laughed so much when I read it. And then not everybody sees it that way. It's, it's like Kafka's Metamorphosis. I mean, when Kafka read it to his friends, he'd laugh so hard that he'd fall out of his chair. You know, <laughs> we don't always notice that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.